Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. The time of King Herod after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? We've observed his star at its rising and we've come to pay him homage. We've come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was frightened. Would you say the word frightened? And all of Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. Where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea. Dropping down to verse 7, then Herod secretly, would you say the word secretly? secretly. He called for the three, for the, excuse me, for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And, and when you found him, bring me word so that I may go and worship him. I may go pay him homage. And when they heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. Would you say the word joy? Joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. They worshipped him. They opened their treasure chest, and they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Verse 13. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Why do you want to do that? Herod is about to search for the child. What's his name? Come on, talk to me now. Herod's trying to kill Jesus. And Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt. Put your finger right there and go to the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter. Go to the book of Revelation, go to Jude, and then 3rd John, 2nd John, 1st John, go on by Peter, 2nd Peter, 1st, and then James. Then you'll be in Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. I normally don't do this, but I'm going to ask you please to find it. If you're looking in the Pew Bible, it's on page 266 of the New Testament section. If you're looking at the church Pew Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing into the divided soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare in the eyes of the one to whom we must Render an account. Listen to it again. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast to our confession. But we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. Say the word sympathize, please. Sympathize. We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect has been tested. Some of your Bibles say tempted. As we are tested, yet, what's your Bible say? Talk to me now without sin. 
Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, hallelujah, so that we may receive mercy, find grace to help us in a time of need. In Matthew chapter 2, we heard verse 13, get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt. God talking to Joseph. Remain there until I tell you, Herod is trying to search for the child to destroy him. I want to share a little message today that the Lord gave me, and I want to simply call it, Let It Go. Say it with me, Let It Go. Let it go. Come on, say it again, Let It Go. Let it go. Christmas time is here. When I read Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus Christ, we found some of that which has inspired some of the beautiful songs that we sing. We talk about silent night, holy, holy night. We talk about all of the things that we see, not all of them, but the things that we read in the text today. We see it in the scripture. We learn about the wise men. We learn about the giving of gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And this time of the year, we pay attention to these portions of Scripture from the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of John. And every year we read them, and every year we consider the truths from the text. But I can't remember hearing a sermon that deals with this portion that we find here in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. It says that after they left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and hang out in Egypt there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child. The child is Jesus to destroy him. What does that say to you? What does it say to me, my brothers and sisters? I need you to know that Jesus, although he was God incarnate, God in the flesh, although he was Emmanuel, although he was born to save the people of their sin, even though he was altogether beautiful and altogether lovely, somebody was trying to hurt our Jesus. Somebody was trying to kill the one who knew no sin. And my brothers and sisters, it is something about this passage of scripture that let me know that it's very possible somebody here, even at Christmas time, knows what it's like for somebody to do you wrong. Somebody feels it today, brothers and sisters. Fact about it, you don't even look forward to Christmas dinner. Somebody's going to be at the table that did you dirty. Somebody's going to stop by with a rum cake. And smile in your face. And act like it didn't happen. But deep in your head and down in your heart, you know it was the same one that abused you when you were seven. Somebody don't like Christmas. Because it causes us to confront, even in good families, things that are painful. Things that happen and we try to sweep them under the rug. And I'm painfully aware just by what happened in very recent days. I preach the things that I know and I preach the things that I feel. And sometimes God will let me be a part of something that inspires me in such a way, that moves me in such a way. And I'm painfully aware of this rich truth right here that when it's time for celebration, somebody is still in the suffering season. Amen. Because it's Christmas time and it's stuck in my head. 
and it's stuck in my heart, and I can't seem to shake it. Fortunately, today I'm not talking about my own family, but I'm painfully aware that it's very, very likely that somebody here today is having trouble letting it go. Yes. Say it with me, please, let it go. Could you say it one more time? Let it go. Let it go. L-I-G. We know, sisters and brothers, that Jesus is our role model. And I'm very much aware of the fact that Jesus was unique, born of a virgin, knew no sin. The reason why I had us over in the book of Hebrews, because the text reminds us that he was tempted in every aspect of his life, like we are, yet without sin. So I just want to play with it in my mind a little bit, because even Jesus had somebody that was trying to do him dirty. And though Herod died, and maybe Jesus just had to hear the story when you were younger, somebody was trying to kill you. We have record in the scripture that what Herod did was so crazy and so bizarre and so heinous. He tried to kill all the babies that could have been Jesus. Can you imagine how that must have felt? That you're Jesus and you know no sin. Somebody's trying to do you in. I'm coming to talk to somebody today that was victimized. I'm here to talk to somebody today that you never have a chance, haven't had a chance to reconcile these issues. And I'm here to talk to myself and talk to others of you here today because sometimes, say the word sometimes, whoop, sometimes we are victims. Ah, but I'm a witness today. Sometimes we are the victimizers. And I have to say that I've made some mistakes along this thing called life. And I've hurt some folks along the way. And maybe somebody said, I'm having a hard time letting it go because of what he did. And maybe you're saying, I'm having a hard time letting it go because of what she did. But maybe just maybe God sent me by here today. Because when you look in the mirror, you're saying, I'm having a hard time letting it go because of what I did. Come to help somebody get free today. Let the church say amen. And so, we look at Matthew's gospel, and we find Jesus, somebody trying to kill him. And I talk to some people who maybe not are facing the gunman's bullet or the mean man's knife. But look like they're trying to kill you with their words. Scandalizing your name. Calling you everything but a child of God. And sometimes you know when people have been doing you wrong, you just want to stop them in the streets and say, why you keep dogging me? Talk to somebody today that needs some help, letting it go. Say it with me, let it go. I'm going to say it like you mean it, let it go. Speak to yourself, brothers and sisters. You gotta encourage yourself in the Lord. And so this Hebrews passage proves to be helpful. Just take a peek at it one more time. Hebrews chapter 4 is beautiful and instructive, instructive and beautiful because it seems to me what God does in this Hebrews 4 is to let us know some things that if we ponder them even at Christmas time when we're having trouble letting it go, say it with me again, let it go. Maybe this will help us. Look at verse 12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Look at verse 13. Before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and lay bare to the eyes of the one on whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Sisters and brothers, I'm here to tell you today the first thing in the story is that will prove helpful is this, that when you're trying to let it go, I need you to know that God saw it, God sees it, and God will take 
care of it. Let the church say amen. amen. You see, sometimes, brothers and sisters, you've been hurt or you've hurt somebody else, and you're wondering, where was God? I looked for God to help me, and I couldn't find the evidence of God. But I stopped by to tell you, listen, don't miss it. God saw it. God sees it. But I've been hanging around with Jesus long enough. <laughs> and I've been thinking about what he says and what he's done in my life. And I have a feeling that somehow, since he saw it, he'll deal with the evil things in this world. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. It's not your job to fix it. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And somebody here can say amen because you've lived long enough to see God work out some stuff. Which evidence that he saw it, say God sees it. God sees it. Come on, say it again, please. God sees it. The old preachers would sing songs, old saints of the church, and they would say things that would help us theologically. They would say, we'll understand it better by and by. But don't get it twisted. God sees, God saw it, and God's going to work it out. Not only does the text say that God sees it, it says here that all, uh, no one will be hidden. All, no one, uh, all of us must render an account. But the second part of it is, is you have been victim or you a victimizer. I need you to see this part. Let us hold fast to our confession. Because we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect has been tempted, tested as we are, yet without sin. Here's the second thing. Not only asking does God see it, but God understands. Let the church say amen. Woo! You ought to be able to smile at me at least because God understands. Text says that he was in every difficult situation. He understands what you've been through. He understands how they did you. He understands that you're still struggling with it. Aren't you glad he understands? When other folk don't understand, the Lord understands. Ought to be a witness here today. I said when other folk don't understand, when you hold your head down in shame, the Lord will put his arms around you and say, I'm not through with you yet. Let the church say amen. amen. I said he understands. Say it with me, he understands. Amen. 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 Stories told of a boy back in the day before the vaccine. Sister Kathy, the story says he had, he had polio. And he had them braces on his legs. Some of you know or heard about the way it was. The youngster come Christmas time and, you know, kids can be cruel. And if you're different, say the word different. In school, kids can be mean. And they point out stuff and make fun of you. And the story is this little boy, because he had the braces on his legs, the kids were teasing him, making fun of him. It was Christmas time, he had a good daddy. Daddy was trying to bring some joy, would you say the word joy? Joy to his heart because he was a little different. So I know what I'll do, that boy, I've been talking about a puppy. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get that little boy a puppy for Christmas. That'll make him happy. Down a couple of farms over, he knew that Mr. Jones, dog had given some pups and so he called him Mr. Jones said my little boy is a good boy he's got polio and the kids have been teasing him said trying to bring some joy to his life wonder if you let me buy one of the little puppy come on down brother Williams come on down and so uh, the, the way the thing was situated up on the hill was a dog house where all the little pups were and the mother was there with them and so uh, the fellow Mr. Jones he standing there with Mr. Williams and Mr. Williams little son with the polio braces on his leg he went like this Y'all didn't know the pastor could do that, did you? Yeah. And when he was like that, all the little pups came running down the hill. 
They just come down just to scurry. And, you know, little puppies, they just fun. It's all falling there, running down the hill. Uh, Mr. Williams would drive happy with his litter of dogs. And surely there's one here, little fella, that, and he was looking around, and all of a sudden, say all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and one little puppy comes out of the doghouse. He was a little slow getting out. He was smaller than the other little puppies. He wasn't as sure-footed. He'd come down the hill a little slower than the rest of them, but he had a joy in his eyes. So the little fella was looking at the puppies, and Mr. Jones said, well, little fella said, uh, all these beautiful dogs, look at this one here, he got the spots on, look at that, this one got some broad shoulders and all that. He looked all over top of them fine looking puppies and he, he said, this one right here is the one I want. He pointed at the little one that had some, some shortcomings. He wasn't able as some of the others. Mr. Williams looked at the little boy and said, surely you don't want him, he's the runt. He can't do some of the things that these other good looking puppies can do. And the story is that the little fella pulled up his pants legs and showed Mr. Jones his braces. He said, I understand Mr. Jones, but this puppy needs somebody like me. He needs somebody who understands. Amen. And I stop out here to tell you today that the Lord understands. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know they talked about you in school, and I know it's hard because you haven't been able to get over it, and you're 50 now. But I'm here to tell you, the Lord, he saw it, he sees it, Woo. and, oh yes he does, I'm glad about it, he understands. Let the church say amen. amen. I love this little passage of scripture. Because not only does it show me when I can't let it go, Sister Mary McGee, that the Lord sees it. Hallelujah. The Lord, mm, he understands. Uh, but verse 16 helps me. It says, let us therefore approach the throne not sheepishly, not tentatively, uh, but with boldness. Why? Because it says, Brother Aaron, that he'll, he'll allow us to receive mercy and grace. That, that was your shouting at you right there. Amen. When I can't let it go, Lord, because of something I did or something somebody did to me, when you can't let it go, because of something you did or something somebody did to you, I need you to know that he sees it. He understands it and he understands you and he's still giving you grace. Amen. Let the church say amen. amen. I said he's still giving us grace. In good families, Amen. stuff happens. With good people, mistakes are made. And I'm not here to say that somebody that wronged you, you got to all of a sudden be bosom buddies. I'm not saying that. But I'm asking you don't add insult to injury. Ask the Lord to help you. And his grace is sufficient. Amen. Find what you need at the cross. Reverend in Dallas, they would say you didn't preach until you went to Calvary. On Friday, they hung him high. And he stretched him wide. He 
He shoved the thorny crown on his head. He gambled for his robe. They laid him in a borrowed tune all day Saturday and all night Saturday. But early Sunday morning, whoop, he got up with all power in his hands. And that power is enough to see you through. I love to hear him sing, Amazing grace shall always be my song of grace. For it was grace brought my liberty, brought my liberty. I do not know. I don't deserve it. That's why he came. Love me so. Let it go. He looked beyond our faults. Oh, sing it, sister.
on, tell him, I need, I need. I need. to understand that. 